Okay. Thanks for coming today, and thanks for inviting me, Nikolai, to this uh, this event. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, so, how many entrepreneurs in the audience? About half of you. How many are now involved in their own startup, or have already launched a startup? So, not in stealth mode. About half. half. Okay, it's twenty-five percent. Okay, it's good. So, I just want to know who I'm talking uh, talking to here. Um, so, I think this is actually the first presentation that I've done of this type where I'm talking about lessons learned from, from this experience. So it really, this was an introspective uh, process for me. Um, normally I would go and pitch my products and my company and I'd try to get investors or uh, I would uh, you know, do PR for the company or something like that. So this is really the first time that I'm doing, uh, doing, doing it in this, in this fashion. But uh, so, so what I've decided to do is uh, you know, keep it informal, uh, tell sort of more of a personal story, but lace in some of the lessons learned uh, that I saw over the, over, the, over the seven years, which was actually more nine years because this whole thing started during an MBA program. It took a while until we actually launched the company. Um, so I've got ten, 10 lessons that I think I can say uh, that, that I've learned that I want to pass on. And maybe you recognize all of them and you say, hey, we already know this. That's fine. Uh, hopefully there's one or two things in there you can pick up and, uh, and learn from. So what did we do at Recon? Um, so we did... A heads-up display or uh, displays for the sports industry. And we started out in skiing and snowboarding, uh, very specific about the, the use case. Uh, and I think I'll come back to that later, but that's, I think, a big reason why uh, we ended up exiting to Intel and why we were successful in a very difficult market. I mean, hardware is difficult, but then think about creating hardware for a non-existing customer uh, and where that customer only uses your product three, three, three days a year and then you charge them $600 for it. That's like a really bad unit economics uh, equation. Um, so, so this was driven uh, through, uh, through passion and, uh, and also touched on a, on a larger theme uh, in the augmented reality space. And, so, and, and the smartphone was launched and all these other things happened in the macro environment, which helped us. Um, but coming back to recon, so we we uh, created these, uh, these modules that fit into ski goggles, and we, we sold them through uh, big partners like Oakley and Smith and Uvex and Scott, and we had 80% of the eyewear companies out there that were producing goggles. Um, and uh, we made it as a modular solution, and then eventually we pivoted and sold uh, our own brand of eyewear, which, was, which we call Recon Jet. Uh, and we, had, we were based on an Android platform, um, and we decided that after the first product we launched, which is really the focus of this presentation, is what I call getting from zero to one. And that's really the first product which I look back on today. I think we have an, one in the bag over there. And it's completely outdated technology. And, and it was really not representing what we ended up having in the company. We had something that was more of a platform and had uh, much more functionality with a camera and GPS and all kinds of things. Actually, this had GPS, of course, but, but, a, lot of, but a lot of things were built into that. Uh, after the first launch. But I want to focus on how we got from zero to one and some of the lessons there because that's the hardest thing to do. So that was the exit to Intel, which was 2015, uh, and this was 2008. So that's where we started. So we went from, from this worth, uh, I think, negative. We were down about $50,000 <laughs> even at that stage, and, and then seven years later sold for over a billion kronos, right? So, it's, so how do you do that in a market that doesn't exist? with a product that's overpriced and you, uh, the people rarely use it. Um, that's, that's what we'll talk about. But first, I want to go back and talk a little bit about the entrepreneurial journey uh, because I think that that's important to understand what, where does it actually begin? You know, where, at what point are you, do you decide that you're an entrepreneur? And, uh, and I call it getting off the train because you, most people are on this train and they don't even realize it. It's going really fast, and if you like being on that train, you stay on the train. And there's nothing wrong with that. You'll get to your destination. But if you don't like the train, you need to get off. And before you even think about getting an idea for something, you need to think about whether you're on the right path or not. And, and that usually starts with you thinking, being annoyed with something. For me, I was 30 years old. Uh, I didn't have a midlife crisis, per se, because I was 30 years old. I had more of a crisis that I didn't feel that I was applying myself in the job that I was in. And I was a, you know, I'm an engineer from Albuquerque University, and, um, 
and I did an, um, I went uh, and became a consultant right after school there in 2001. Uh, for PwC, and then IBM bought PwC Consulting, and I was implementing SAP systems, uh, supply chain planning. Sounds super dry, right? And it was, I had fun in the first six months, and then I felt that I wasn't really using my strengths. Like, I can do all those things, and I can be technical, and, but I really, I'm more of a generalist, and I, I needed to have something that was more, that was more creative stuff in there, and where I could be in control of that process. So, so. When I was uh, 30, I was uh, doing a freelance job at that stage uh, in, uh, for Arla Foods, actually, in, uh, in Aarhus. And, um, and I decided suddenly one day that I was going to just quit that and do an MBA. That was sort of what many un engineers, I guess, think at some point is how can I kind of retool my skill set. Um, and, um, and I always wanted to go to Australia because I found this, so this mystical place, you know, far away that, um, you know, it was sort of the... the an, an island and a country and a continent in one, and it had all these crazy animals, you know, with extravagant amounts of poison, you know, just for the heck of it. And I just thought this was, this was an interesting place. So, so I was driven by that. I didn't know anything else than that. I just knew that, that I was going to make a change. Um, so I applied for, uh, for some grants. I got, thank you, Nikolai, some lists from actually, uh, from Nikolai about, you know, which institutions to. Uh, um, so I applied for these grants, got them, and then I went to Australia. So this was 2005, and I started there January 2006. And when I landed there, I found that everybody else, was almost without, it, without exception on the MBA program, had the same sort of feeling that they needed to reset. They didn't know what that reset was. They came from all aspects of life. And uh, so you kind of find a kinship there in that program, and, and it, was just, uh, it was just really great to have that, to have that fresh start. But of course, five months into it, once you open up and become like, hey, I want to do something else, your antennas are out, you start to see opportunities everywhere because you don't have the baggage of being on that train. Um, so I walked into an entrepreneurship, sorry, not an entrepreneurship, this was actually an exchange program auditorium. It's actually by mistake. I walked in there and I saw the Vancouver skyline and it looked great and there were some mountains in the background and, um, and this was, there was two spots open for the exchange. And I had just, I mean, I had barely come to Australia and I was now looking at going somewhere else. But, uh, but nobody wanted to go there. Everybody wanted to go to London Business School and Harvard and whatever, Columbia. They wanted to boost their resumes and stuff. And, uh, and um, I just thought, well, this could be pretty cool. So I just raised my hand. I'm going to go. And I convinced my friend to go. Two months later, we were, we were on a flight to Vancouver. And, uh, and the first course I signed up for was the entrepreneurship course. And then, then the story began. Right? But, but there was no idea at that stage. It was just... Just trying something out, seeing what happened, and exposing yourself to other people, that's really where it begins, and that's, that's the most important thing. Okay, so lesson number one, act on your dreams, dare to make a big change without knowing exactly where it's going to take you. Be open to inspiration, but fail fast on things that don't stick. This last part is really important, because you're going to inevitably try things that don't really, they don't really fit what you want. So you need to be very fast at acknowledging that and then moving on. So uh, that's the whole fail fast mentality that I use for everything actually in life. It's very, very important because your time is your most valuable resource by far. Now we get to the idea stage. So how did, like a lot of people ask me, so how did you come up with this idea? And, and I sort of see it, see it in two different ways. You're either kind of mulling over an idea, something's been nagging you for decades or years, and you kind of tell your friend, they all get sick of hearing about this pain that you have, and you want to solve it, and you never do anything about it, and then one day, suddenly, you meet the right people, and you go. And then there's the eureka moment, where you are just suddenly going, ah, this is what I need to do. This, this, this is the idea. That was actually what happened to me. Most people that I think are in the first camp, it's, they're sort of doing different things, and then over time, they kind of come up with an idea. For me, it was totally a eureka moment. Uh, we had to, as one of the first things in the entrepreneurship class, we had to pitch uh, a, an idea, and then the, the most popular ideas became projects. And, uh, and, and typical me, on the day, I hadn't actually prepared a pitch. Um, it was a uh, typical procrastinator. So, so uh, I was sitting on the lunch break, and it was a 2 o'clock pitch, and I was uh, having lunch outside, looking out over the... Um, so I was sitting there having lunch, and, and uh, on the campus of University of British Columbia, there was an Olympic-sized pool 
that I actually went to almost every day there. And, uh, but I was looking out over this pool and I was having my lunch and I just thought, hmm, what am I actually passionate about? What is it that I know a lot about and, and where you know, I feel that there's been a pain? And, and I kind of thought, well, what about something to do with swimming? And, and I, I used to swim you know, two to four hours a day for most of my life up until I was in my mid-20s. And, um, uh, and, and I was training for the 1500 meter freestyle. That was kind of my event. So I was, I was looking at you know, the pool clock quite a lot. And I always found, and I had you know, three coaches that were trying to keep track of everybody's times. And I had earplugs in. I couldn't hear the times that I was being given. So it was really, there was a huge pain there. So I was spending a lot of time in a sport where you know, you're winning or losing races for, you know, in, within hundreds of a second. Yet there was actually absolutely no tools available to give you data. So I thought, well, that, that's a big pain. I know a lot about it. What if, what if I came up with something that had a display? And this was 2006 that could show you in real time your metrics. And, and I knew there was something, some sensors that were being developed, and, but I didn't know anything about the solution yet. I just knew the pain was there. So obviously there must be a way to solve it. And, and that's, so that's what I scribbled down on a piece of paper. And I went straight into uh, to that uh, classroom, did a pitch much like a classroom like this. And, and, um, and people started coming up to me, and I thought it was a fantastic idea. Because, oh, that's so cyborg-like, and it's like an F-16 fighter, fighter helmet. And I was like, no, 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 it's actually a real problem. Like, you, you're trying to solve something here. Um, so that's, um, that, that was the idea. And, um, and so, so the, the, next, the next slide here, oh, sorry, the, this, this lesson is that the right idea will come to you when you least expect it. You'll know because it's going to be something you care a lot about and where you yourself can feel the pain. But if it doesn't pull people in, then it's likely going, then it's likely going to fail. Focus on that last sentence. Because if I had gone into the classroom and I had pitched this idea and nobody had come up to me, then what do you think I would have done? I would have probably gone and joined some other project. So you, you need, it, it, it's not enough that you're passionate about it. You need to be able to articulate it and then you need to make sure that other people can see that. And, and our project was by far the most popular in terms of how many people came up um, up to me and wanted to be part of it because it just has this magical thing to it. There was such a gravity around it, I, I found that, uh, that I found throughout the, you know, the seven years after we started the company, which helped get investors and, uh, and, and was really a, a big sort of magnetic um, force around, around the company. So this is a little dry mouth because I'm jet lagged. I'm like nine, nine hours from Vancouver to here. so. I promise I won't want to sleep on the, on the stage. So this is, um, actually this was a little bit later, this was after our pro project, uh, our first launch. I just wanted to show you this. Th these are my founders, co-founders. Um, and, uh, and, and so there's, like I think one of the most important aspects of starting a company is, is a team, you know, the founder team. You know, who are they, where you meet them, uh, what are people's roles, and, um, and this sort of bond that you have with your founders is very, very important because you're going to go through hell together. And you're going to be tested um, in all sorts of ways. So for us, for me, all these people came up to me in, in, that, uh, uh, in that pitch I did in 2006. Um, and I chose those three because um, we had complementary skills. Darcy was in marketing, consumer marketing. Fraser was the crazy guy, uh, software engineer working in the gaming industry, had started and folded like 10 companies. And I thought, that's the greatest thing to have an unsuccessful entrepreneur. He can tell me all the things that I didn't know. And then Hamid was our CTO. And, uh, and his story was he came up to me, and he was very introvert and very awkward. And, and, uh, and I was like, he was the last person to come up to me. And, and I asked, so, so what, what do you do? And he said, well, I, uh, I have a lab here at UBC. And I, I've built an underwater robot that I, that's remote controlled. And, uh, and I know exactly how to build what you just pitched. And he said it with such, such conviction that I was like, okay, you're, you're in. And I actually had another person that I had said was in. I had to kind of bump him out. And then I just had to work on the interpersonal thing. I'm like, okay, you're definitely in for your skill set. But we'll have to work on the interpersonal stuff. And that, that kind of came afterwards. Um, but so... so that, that founder team is really important. So, I mean, Nikolai, you mentioned there, you know, the more founders you are, of course, the more you have to share the pie. But also, if you put it together right and you have the right skills in the mix, you can create a bigger pie. And I think that's definitely the case here. 
you have to make sure, so this is the lesson here, um, your partners in crime will understand your idea intuitively and be energized by it. They will fight for their right to stay close, important. You'll have a lot of people that are interested and then they kind of have 10 other things, but people that are actually deserving of a founder status, they will fight to stay close. And, uh, and, but but uh, you have to make sure that, that, you, that the team has complementary skills. And you have to strive for synergy, not compromise. Don't try to please people because you just want to be nice. Because that's going to, just, that's going to hurt the company and the team later on. And uh, it's kind of like also the band where everybody wants to be the lead singer or uh, somebody. It's just like it's going to go. Uh, it, it, people need to know their roles and their lanes. And you need to stick to them. And if there's any kind of uncertainty there, you need to address it up front. You need to be very, very transparent because that, now I've crossed over to the other side here after, and I'm actually a VC now, in, in, in a seed stage VC. Um, so now I see it from the other side, and I can see dysfunctional teams where, where the founding group has not had the conversations, and there's no respect for who's actually in charge of making the decisions. Because as you grow the company, nobody wants to work in a company where there's four CEOs. It's like, who's going to make the decision here? There needs to be one person who makes the final call. And, uh, so that's, and everybody has to respect that. It cannot be just like an honor and title. It has to be the right person. Prototyping. So this is something that I have gone through so many times now. I think we ended up at six generations of products and uh, just extremely, extremely painful, but also rewarding experience. Um, this, I, I chose to show something that doesn't look like it's, uh, we have a, I have a lot of great pictures of beautiful electronics and all this stuff. I'm not gonna show you that. This was the very first proof of concept. Ski goggles, they were $29. And then we got a uh, Copen, uh, sorry, we didn't get a Copen display. We got um, uh, an off the shelf display we bought uh, at uh, I think Best Buy or Future Shop or whatever. And then we took apart a media viewer from a company called MyView uh, back then. And then we glued it on. And, and it just so happened that that lens was perfect for the video, the signal we were, we were passing through. So you could put it up close to your eye and you could actually see everything in focus, whereas normally you wouldn't be able to do that. Like if you take a phone and put up here, you wouldn't be able to see what's on it. So we kind of found off the shelf things for 10 bucks here, 40 bucks there, put it together. And then we had a program um, that we ran on a laptop and then we had a backpack. And then we put the, uh, we connected the laptop uh, through a cord to this display. And then, we actually simulated speed. We just simulated it. And then we went running with it on the campus. So I was running all over the campus. I was known as the, the complete wacko guy who and I was just running around with this. What I was trying to do is this, is, this is after the team, this is the most important thing. And it's called the value proposition. If you do not test your value proposition, you can make any amount of PowerPoints, uh, any amount of financial modelings with all these hockey stick curves, uh, you're going to fail eventually. You're going to fail. So you have to understand what the value is. When I ran with that and I saw that I could actually run and see the data and I started imagining what that could do compared to the alternatives, I started to see that th this is not an incremental, this is a 10x. This is something that if we nail this, even if it takes seven years, I don't think anybody else is going to solve that in, in that in that time period. So we. Uh, that, that was very important before I started doing any you know, slides or anything else. Um, there's a little bit of a caveat here because we met in school, so we wrote the business plan in school and we didn't, have, we didn't, we didn't do this until we actually incorporated the company. So we were in a safe school environment, we had to do that, so we, we went along and, um, and wrote this business plan and we, even, we pivoted uh, very early on. We had, I always say we had three pivots. Um, for those of you who don't know what a pivot is, is you're actually changing your business model or your, your market, like from selling to one customer to another customer or using a different product to sell to the same customer. Um, and for us, we had three pivots. The first one was the swimming market. That was where we started. But then as we wrote the business plan, we found a patent that looked to be, could be a problem down the road. And we went up to our instructor, our instructor and he said, well, what will you do in real life? And, and we said, um, we kind of knew the answer to that. We probably, we would probably spend a, we wouldn't have enough uh, money to throw at like a freedom to operate uh, uh, investigation with lawyers. So we probably would have started to look for another customer or another vertical with the same technology. And so we, even though we had two weeks to go before the midterm, we actually went back in a room and we thought, just whiteboarded, who would want something instantly? 
and there's all these ideas, you know, in the workplace and all this and that. But, but, but who would want it that had the money to buy it and where we could build it in to a product that, um, that was big enough so that we could kind of mitigate some of the risk? Because the swimming goggle, difficult, difficult market, underwater, very small. Goggles are 25 bucks, you know, this, we, were gonna we knew it was going to be several hundred bucks. And uh, we knew Olympics was coming up um, in 2010, so that was you know, three and a half years later. So we thought, well, why not, why not go into skiing? And, and that's, that's the, that was the first pivot. And we came back in midterms with this half done pro, uh, presentation and, 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 and the instructor said, okay, you can continue on this. And uh, so, so that, that's, uh, that was the, the business plan process there. And, but the value proposition, I think, was when we really sort of, they'd hit home, okay, now we have something. Now we can, we can go to the next phase, which, which is gonna be funding. I'll talk about that next. So the value proposition is the most important thing to get right. It dictates your focus and priority for years to come. If you can't clearly articulate how you're going to generate value for your customers, then you don't have a viable business. And this sounds like, yeah, I know that. I've seen that before in you know, whatever you know, business class I did. But it, it's, it's really difficult. I, I found it very difficult to then articulate the value proposition in a way that was succinct. Like you spend a lot of time thinking about how you actually, which words you choose, and then validating the assumptions behind those words. Okay, so now you're ready to go. What uh, do you need? You need cash, you need fuel. We're getting into uh, to Nikolai's uh, uh, domain here. I had never raised money before. I had no idea how you raise money. I'd written some applications for grants, government institutions and stuff, and that was, that was, that was about it. Uh, so where do you start? And, and so I started with Nikolai. And, uh, and I, I don't know how it came about, but I somehow, you know, uh, you very early on said, hey, you know, I'll throw in 30,000. If you can get, I said I needed 115,000. If you can get the remainder up to the 115, I will put in 30. But it's conditional on that. I was like, damn, I just want the 30, because then I could pay down. <laughs> but he's like, no, 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 you have to get the full round. So, so I went around, asked some other friends, and, uh, but I was still about 20K short in the end. And I don't know if I've told you the story, but so, so I, was, I, was, I was living on the... Uh, I was living on the east side in, in Vancouver. Vancouver is a really nice place, but down on the east side of Main Street, it looks like, if you remember that Michael Jackson thriller uh, movie or whatever it's called, a music uh, video, where these dead people that come crawling out, out and, and it's these zombies, it, it, that's really the east side of Vancouver. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's terrible uh, in, the, in sort of a, in a social aspect, but that's, that's the way it is. So I got a, a place down there for you know, a few hundred bucks, and, uh, and I was really living, not because I wanted to live there, but that was, like, I really didn't have uh, any money. And, um, and I, you know, that, that seemed like the right, right thing to do. But so the, on a Saturday afternoon, I went, uh, I couldn't find the 20K. Uh, I tried everything, so I went to this, uh, this local bar down there and, um, and sat there drinking. And, and this guy came up, this Nigerian guy, and said, uh, hey, you know, <laughs> uh, well, what's going on? It's like, uh, you look a little bit down. I'm like, oh, you know, I just, I, I'm, just, I'm just off some money for a startup. And he's like, oh, tell me about it. So I told him about it. And he said, yeah, I, you know, that sounds pretty interesting. <laughs> um, uh, and, but he didn't say, Let's, I'll invest. He said, I'll meet you tomorrow. And then you can pitch to me. And I'm like, that's kind of weird. But today we should go drinking. So we went drinking <laughs> that day. And, and I thought I would never hear from him again. Next morning I got a text. And he's like, yeah, okay, I'm ready. I went, pitched to him. And he suddenly had a suit on. And it was, it was so weird. So this guy is Lamy, who became a close friend. And he put in the 20K. And, he, and today he said he had already decided to invest at the bar, but he wanted to just put me through this painful process. <laughs> so I had to pitch to him for like two hours, and he asked all these questions. He came from the banking industry, and, uh, and it was so funny. So at the end, he wrote the check, and then I called Nikolai, and then he transferred the money. And then that was, that was the hardest money to get, was that first $115,000. I, I thought it was... Like it was so much money back then, uh, and of course later on it just becomes this. Yeah, you're always in fundraising mode. One, ten, twenty. I mean, I think I raised thirty-five million dollars in the end. So, so, uh, but, but it, but it's really that first round of external investors. That's that's when you get tested also on some of your basic assumptions, and it's it's just a really uh, uh, important experience. So, for fundraising, learn how to become a fundraising machine. You will need the money, but. Before raising a dime, think about what profit looks like for your business. Understand your unit economics and create a believable plan. And 
unit economics is so important because often what I hear entrepreneurs say to me is when they pitch to me, is it's like, yeah, we don't really make money today, but when we're you know, two years down the line, when we're at scale, we'll make a lot more money. And I say, no, no, you'll actually be more in debt because what you don't factor in, thanks, what you don't factor in is that there are all kinds of other costs. Yeah, you might reduce your supply chain cost, your material cost, but your organizational costs and marketing costs and all these other costs come in. So your bottom line, like it's gonna be, it's gonna be negative. So um, you need to understand what profit looks like uh, because ideally you don't, you don't raise any money. But when you start thinking about what profit looks like, then you know, have a much better idea what money you actually need, at least for the next year. Uh, and, and then an investor will think, oh, this person thought about it, thought about returns, that's important to me. I may never see the company go to profit, but at least it's heading in the right direction. For uh, prototyping, this, these are actual pictures of uh, some of the early prototypes. Again, in the first, for the first product that you see down there, bottom right, which was uh, re the Transcend, which we'll talk about. Top left is what call, what's called an evaluation board. So we basically went and uh, bought this for, I think it was like 400 bucks. We, we thought it was a lot of money there and it had those old, you know, double A batteries and a GPS unit and linked it up and we tried to get the firmware right and looked at, okay, what do we actually need? And the goal was to shrink it down to what's on the left there, which is very small, like the size of my thumb, um, which we of course did. And then bottom left is, um, you know, you got to start some, we'd never done goggles before. We had no idea at all. Uh, so. We got this 3D printed, this was 2008. And uh, that's, that's kind of the initial concept was we had something down here, we didn't know how to really put it together. But lo and behold, that's what ended up happening. And, and this is kind of uh, the Recon Transcend where the display is down the bottom right. And uh, we had the buttons on the side and the battery on the other side and the cable going across. Lots of thinking went into that, but just uh, the idea is here that you don't know what the result's gonna be in the end. And we'll talk about how we got to that goggle, because we ended up not making that goggle ourselves, but um, we ended up partnering for it. But don't be too worried about the end result, or uh, that, oh, we're not very far and it's not polished yet. The polished part is the easiest part. Like ask, ask an artist, like when they you know, do a painting or something, most of the work is in actually doing all the groundwork of sketching out where things should be, understanding where light's gonna come in, and all the ugly stuff that's, that's uh, under the hood that's the hard part. And, and it's chaotic, and it, it has to be chaotic. You have to embrace the fact that it's chaotic and kind of enjoy that journey. Because the last part, when you put it together, it will all, if you do the foundation right, the rest, the rest will come. So lesson number six is developing a new product that technology is hard. It takes longer than you think and, and costs way more than you forecasted. That's for sure. Whatever forecast you have, you, you, like usually when we invest, I always 2x or 3x it. Uh, and then on time, I two exit or three exit, and then that's my number, and then I come back, and then people think, oh, I don't understand why you're lowballing. I'm like, no, no, I actually think I'm being generous to you. And every single time, like, because I also have been on the other side, so I know, like, I used to, I used to tell these stories. Um, and that's fine, but investors will do that automatically. They will just make, make the calculation in their heads. Um, the bottom part here, I think, is extremely, and we could do a whole session on team. And this is something that I see even mature companies in the startup world do wrong, they want to save some money, they think they can do everything themselves, and then they don't hire the right people. And then that company, you can't really scale. You need to look at who you need, like what skill sets you need, uh, and then you need to hire accordingly, and not try and bootstrap on something that's gonna be critical to your success. Uh, so don't be afraid to hire senior people from start who can both lead and contribute. Uh, they become your trusted lieutenants, and through them, you'll, great, you'll greatly accelerate your efforts and build a team that can adapt to new challenges. And this last part here, again, is you don't want to have to go and reinvent everything again. You, you need something uh, almost like a, like you need an organization that can adapt where uh, you'll automatically find yourself sort of going more and more away from what you did in the first year, like year two and year three. Like in the year one, I was doing you know, bookkeeping and I was also the CFO and I was the office manager and I was also doing market, I was doing everything. And then you kind of move yourself uh, away from things uh, and you need to find people that can actually come in and do a much, much better job and, uh, and be able to grow with the business. Launch, so this is Darcy here, uh, former head of marketing. Uh, and uh, that was then our new office uh, that we got uh, just before, uh, six months before we launched. And um, what I want to talk about here is, this is sort of the commercialization aspect. We ended up, um, this is Oakley by the way, and uh, 
we walked uh, in there. Oakley was interested. Like I, I went to a trade show as one of the very first things uh, when we started the company was I needed to learn, know the industry. I didn't know, knew nothing about the snow, ski sports industry. Didn't know anything about the eyewear industry. So where do you learn that? Well, there's a trade show in Vegas of all places, which is great. We thought, okay, we'll all go there. And, and we'll go from booth to booth to these goggle partners. And we just walked in and said, hey, we're going to do this heads-up display. And every one of them was like, oh, we've been dreaming about this for years. But, and everybody had a Skunk Works project, but they never got anywhere. It's like, oh, it's too hard. Uh, Oakley was not even interested, but then we kind of spent some time. You know, I got through, I, I went to their booth like five times, and then they wouldn't let me in. It was this, uh, it was like, a, like Fort Knox, uh, like there was like, it was like a U-shaped thing, but it was close at the front. And you had to get through the, uh, some assistant there. And every time I went there, it was like it was the first time I went there. I said, well, I'll just talk to you. And I was like, well, you got to talk to Wade Cleveland. Well, he's not here. He flew out. So there's always a new story every time. So by the fifth time, I thought, well, I'm going to wait till somebody else walks up, and I'm going to sneak in behind her and just go in. So that's what I did. I just walked behind her and went into this whole sacred chamber in there. And I saw all these things, and, and, and I met a person in there and got a, got a card. And then that card basically started this whole thing. Because then I went back, called the person, set up a meeting, went down there. This pitch went better than we thought. The CEO came down and was just like crazy about it. And we thought we were going to partner with Oakley. Um, but um, they wanted exclusivity. So they said, yeah, we'll partner with you. But we want, we want full exclusivity. So you can't sell to anybody else. And um, I actually have a, I should have probably showed this. I have a video recording of our conversation with them because we went back and had the business conversation with them on the phone. And uh, it was very tempting. And, um, but I decided that I, I wanted to say, I said no to them. And uh, this was a tough call to in the team. If it was a democratic process, I don't know what would have happened. But, but I, my, my dream was not to become a component supplier to one customer. Because then what's going to happen is they're going to drive down the price. They're going to hide your brand. And you're going to spend all the money developing this stuff. And you're never going to, like I was never going to get money back to Nikolai. And I couldn't let that happen. So, um, so I said no, and they were shocked. And uh, we, we ended up then going with a, another eyewear partner. We knew we had to partner for the eyewear. We did not know enough, and we didn't, we didn't know how to actually get shelf space and all this stuff. So uh, we ended up at the same trade show. They're meeting a company out of Boulder, Colorado called Seal Optics. And that's this guy over there. Michael Jackson is his name, actually. He was just like, he, he was startup. He had done uh, a... Um, back in 2007, he had a sunglass that had a Bluetooth connection to a phone that could, that could basically um, play uh, music. Or was it an MP3 player? Whatever it was, he, he had already thought about integrating technology into eyewear. And, uh, and he had sort of the right, the right mindset. He was small and unknown. You probably never heard of Seal Optics before. So we decided instead of going with the biggest brand in the world, we went with the smallest brand, but it was a better fit. And we could move fast. And I told him, I said, no exclusivity, nothing, but I'll give you a gentleman deal. We will not talk to anybody else until we launch. And we shook hands on it. There was no paper, nothing. Um, and we kept our promise, and we fast-tracked. I believe that if we had not made this deal, we would have never launched, even if we had gone with Oakley, because they would have gone into politics and pricing, and then they would have just stolen our deer, and we wouldn't have ever gone. But this fast track, he had all the connections in China. He could uh, do prototyping in no time. And, uh, and, and he was really, he was a designer. He designed these, this eyewear himself. So he was sitting there designing it, and we were kind of looking at the electronics. Where could we put it in? And so we came up with this two-sided model with batteries on one side, the engine on the other, and then the cable across. So it was a real collaborative environment there. And, uh, and it was just, it was really fantastic. There's a whole story about what happened after this. They ended up being bought by Maui Jim, which is the world's biggest private eyewear company. And, um, and then after that, the whole thing went south, and we had to quickly get, get new partners, uh, which we did, and eventually got Oakley. So, uh, and I actually, so the way we got Oakley was going back. Um, uh, I, had, uh, I was in a, bit of, a lot of trouble at one point because we're running out of money. Worst snow season in the history, almost, of skiing. It was 91, 92. Got stuck with all the, our inventory. I had taken in VC money, $10 million, spent it all. There was nothing left. And I had an organization of 75 people. And I remember making payroll out of my credit line. Uh, and, um, and I was like, okay, now what do we do here? So, so I had talked to a person from Apple at a, a trade show. 
Uh, and, and he had been interested in saying, hey, we're actually are merchandising also third-party products. So I thought, well, what if I could get a deal with Apple? Then I could go to Oakley and Smith, whom I hadn't gotten before, pitch them out against each other and say, you, I will select the one that gets to go in the Apple store. And lo and behold, that worked out. In six weeks' time, I got the Apple deal because I told Apple I had Oakley, which I didn't. And then I went to Smith and said, you know, you get a chance to come in. Um, we really like you. I kind of knew they wouldn't, they wouldn't jump because they're very conservative and I don't like the Apple store and all that stuff. But, uh, but then I could go to, to Oakley uh, and tell them that we were talking to Smith. And I knew that Oakley, they have fear of missing out like nothing else. And if, and if there's something they can't have, they will, they will just do anything to, to get it. Uh, and then I dangled this smart glass that we had a 3D print of in front of them and said, hey, this is, this is the billion dollar deal. This is where we can put smart optics in all your sunglasses around the world. And, and so, so and, but, but you only have until Wednesday next week. And this was to, to the CEO and all the other, all these executive people. And walked out and my uh, co-founders were just sitting there so quiet. We came out we're like, oh, we just destroyed this. It's not going to work out. And I was actually doubting myself too. Uh, but then two days later, the CEO called and said, we have a deal. And then, then Oakley became really our own co only customer because they cannibalized everybody else. Nobody wants a Smith or a Uvix or a Brico or Alpino, whatever goggle we had, if you can get Oakley. So we jacked up the price. We sold through sort of 400 Apple stores around the world. We did partnership with GoPro as well so that you could see <clears throat> the video streaming your goggles. Did all this super cool stuff and sold a lot of units. Um, but, um, but so that's sort of the partnership story. Uh, Behind, behind this. Okay, so most ideas don't make it to market, even great ones. You will need to focus and manage your resources carefully, understand what your MVP is, that's your minimal viable product, and whether a partner can help accelerate your time to market while keeping secret sauce intact and optionality after launch. That last part in brackets should probably be the headline because you don't want to give away something. Like, that's very important. So when you're doing a partnership deal, you really have to think about, okay, why should I partner? Okay, is it to accelerate time to market? Is it to cover for a gap, skill gap that I have? Whatever the answer is, well, how can I do this partnership and get all these benefits? I'm going to give up something, but how can I make sure I don't give up my secret sauce? And how can I make sure that I'm not tied into something later on? I never signed an exclusivity deal, even with Oakley when they came back the last time, because I coerced them into it. And, uh, and uh, they still asked for it. Nope, it's not going to happen. And I think that that, that, was, that was a very important decision. So don't get sort of tempted by the big customer that can do all this stuff for you, they're going to exploit you for sure unless you think about what, what is your game, what is your end game. And then you can usually make a deal with them because they're interested. They're there, right? So you just got to make sure that you get the deal terms. The, a, a super important part of your business as well is, okay, are you a product or a platform? And are you selling B2B or B2C? We were obviously selling B2B. We insisted on co-branding because we were the only heads of display company in the world. So we could just say, okay, we're gonna, we have this modular solution. You're going to have to, and this is Oakley, you're going to have to uh, fit our system. We do the software. We have all the stuff on the phone. That's us. And your customers have to come to that site. And everybody else, you know, competitors at Smith, and we got eventually as well and Scott and those guys, their customers going to the same site. We're not going to create a site for you. We're not going to do any, any of those things. So we were kind of the platform. Uh, and since we're based on Android, we released an SDK, a software development kit. And we said, uh, which was tricky as well, because we're based on Android and we're selling in the Apple stores. And that, that was a conversation that uh, last minute we were launching in the Apple store in Regent Street in London. Uh, we had Sean White. He was going to come in and be the guy behind Oakley. And... Uh, and one of the high ops at Apple called me and said, you didn't tell me you're Android. We hate Android. We can't sell Android in Apple stores. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my heart just sank because I was like, you know, this is going to destroy everything. Um, so, so I kind of said, well, wait, wait a second. Who told you we're Android? Because I knew we weren't Android certified. He said, well, some guy told me he overheard a product manager. I'm like, no, no, we're Linux. And Linux is, of course, what's sitting inside Android. Android just came, Google came and slapped their brand on it. And, uh, and I said, no, no, we're not Android certified. We're Linux. And uh, we have our own forked version of Linux. And we're borrowing a st libraries. So I just went all kind of technical and said all kinds of things. And he's like, oh, OK. He's like, could you put that in an email to me? I'm like, put it in an email, send it to him. And then he came back around midnight and said, we're OK. 
And then it still went, I was like, my God, I can't believe you. And I didn't tell my founders, didn't tell them. I think to this day, maybe I told them, but it's like, I just wanted to keep that thing. So you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta know how to act in your feet. Like if you are about to lose everything and it will happen all the time, the night before it happened when we sold to Intel, to the, the number of times that deal died, I could spend two hours talking about the Intel sale and how I negotiated directly with, with the CEO there and what, like about price and everything else and the kind of things you have to do on the fly is just super important. So, so learn how to think on your feet and be creative. Anyway, that was a tangent. So, um, so, so thinking about who you are, um, whether you're a platform or whether you're a product, is, is extremely important. You can't be both, you have to focus. Um, and for us, we had this idea of modular HUD systems we could put into anything. You know, we actually did a helmet, motorcycle helmet for BMW. And I think we're outside of confidentiality now, so we can say this. And we're about to launch it in 2012 in Italy. It was done, it had gone through all the tests. Our, you know, people were driving with it and um, they pulled the plug last minute and said, we're not gonna do it. But it was, we spent no time on it. We just took our modular hardware with our Android platform. We wrote an app and then there you go. So that's how easy it was. But, but they were still too early. There was like, oh, is this gonna be difficult? Are people gonna act or uh, uh, unsafe? Are people gonna look at that and then crash and all that stuff? So the CEO that decided of the motorcycle division decided not to launch it. Um, we had something bottom right there, which was a uh, uh, retrofit that you could put on the outside of eyewear. Imagine all the places that could go. And we had the sunglasses that we were going to, that was the one I think I showed to Oakley, where we had our uh, sort of architecture that became Jet that was retrofitted to uh, the lens of sunglasses. And the thing is, we knew that lenses were already swappable. So again, coming back to a business model of platform, we had standardized the hardware. We knew we could, we could then convince eyewear companies to adopt that geometry. And then we also had to make sure for sunglasses, well, how would that work? Well, there's already swappable lenses. We had to fix it to the lens, which nobody had done before. And then we could route the, the current over across the lens in this little flex circuit that would cost 50 cents. So we designed that, patented that. Uh, so we had all that. So the platform was there. And we looked at you know, our, lit, our um, uh, data storage uh, platform. We had that both mobile, web. We had apps. We had already made partnerships with a number of companies. And then we were thinking this next chapter of context-based analytics. Uh, and this was way before, I think, a lot of people looking at the data here, but we were thinking, well, what if we could get all this data? And then we had a whole data play where all this, like Strava now, the cycling app has done uh, for cycling, where they have all this information now about uh, urban areas because all these cyclists, they're actually collecting data. So we thought we could do that for the mountain. But um, this was, um, this, was, uh, this was at least for a long time, this is what we, we set out to do. And we ended up doing um, a pivot, of course. And this was the last pivot uh, that, we, that we did. Um, and this was, uh, this was basically doing our own eyewear, being vertically integrated, finding our own eyewear uh, supplier, which is almost impossible because Luxottica owns everything. They own Oakley too. Every time we went to a supplier, oh, we, don't, we can't talk to you. So to find a supplier that's actually worth their salt in eyewear is so hard. And uh, so we, we found one, we de designed our eyewear, and uh, went, you know, now suddenly we were on the box. It didn't say Oakley, you know, with a little Recon brand. It actually was Recon Jet glasses that you could buy, and, uh, and we owned the customer. And we barely launched this, and then Intel bought us. Like, so that was the last paper. So that was great. The, the modular, the platform solution was great on paper. The Excel sheet, the model looked great. It was how I got a good valuation early on because I could show a huge addressable market and I could actually speak and people thought it made sense because they could see the value proposition and they could see we were trying to solve a problem for a specific customer. Uh, and we, we had dialed the unit economics in because we had the modular form factor and we had also thought about how that would be integrated into the helmet. We did our own with 3D printed stuff and we, we knew kind of all the questions that we could anticipate from the future partner. So... I was a little bit bummed out that that didn't work out. The reason it didn't work out, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, unit economics in the end for the entire flow did not work because suddenly now we have a really expensive piece of electronics. Then we need to integrate that into, uh, let's say, a motorcycle helmet. And that's going to take time and cost money. And then assuming that helmet uh, supplier or customer is okay with us going to everybody else, which they usually aren't, that's, that's a huge battle. Then, well, they're going to then add cost, and then there's going to be their distributors that are going to add costs, and then at the end of the day, you're going to have a $2,000 helmet, $1,500 helmet, whatever, and then you can only sell 2000 You cannot sell 100000 of those. 
and maybe sell 10,000. That's the price point of elasticity. You just know that. So how are you then going to scale it up? Also having channel conflicts, uh, potential channel conflicts, and cannibalization, where let's say you bring on five players to get five times 10,000 units. Well, it's not going to be 50,000 units, because you're going to have a dominant player like what happened in, with Oakley in the ivory industry. It's going to take eight or nine percent of the market. Then you're going to have jealousy between the players, like the number of phone calls I've had where somebody, one ivory partner thought that another ivory partner was getting something that they weren't getting, and I had to kind of be the peace broker. Uh, it was it's crazy. So it didn't work out. That's why we did the pivot. So understand whether you're a product or a platform, whether you sell B2B or B2C, identify the customers with greatest product market, focus on greatly increase your chance of success. So there's X and Y, you can do X or Y, do not do X and Y. And, and when you make the decision, you double down, and the people around the table in the company that still feel that have a resistance towards that change, you sit down with them, and if they can't overcome it, then they need to go. Because if there's people in the team that are working against your vision and you don't act on it, your entire, uh, everything falls to pieces. Because people are having water cooler talks and, oh, we should have done this, we should have done that, and that wasn't the right thing. And it's like every single person matters. We need to get behind this idea. And we cannot compromise. I'm not going to please somebody by saying, oh, we can do that too, and we'll get that over and we'll assign some resources. That's, the, that, that's a losing battle. Do not do that. Take the confrontation up front. Be civil about it, but do not be ambiguous. This is a nice graph, and I, uh, we didn't put... Um, you'll, so, there's a, a bit of context behind this. In 2011, we were approached by Google. And we were... Um, let's see what I can, how I can say this. We, we were actually raising funds from our first VC. It was a local VC. And so exactly the roadmap that uh, Nikolai laid out for funding, you know, how you start. And we were at the local VC stage, and we were negotiating this $10 million investment. And lo and behold, I was uh, like desperately trying to, again, get money into the business. And, and these guys were dragging their feet. So I went down to the valley, went to Google um, Barbecue um, uh, in August, I think, 2011, and brought my goggles. It was like in the middle of summer. And, and I knew it was Android, so I thought, you know, that could be cool if, you know, if somebody, the right person saw that. And lo and behold, I was standing there at the bar, and this guy came up to me and said, what's that around your, your neck? And I'm like, oh, these are goggles with, you know, and full Android platform. And I had my remote control, Bluetooth Low Energy, which was the first implementation, actually, in the world we did of a Bluetooth implementation for controls. And, um, you know, and this is, you can kind of see, you know, where you're going on the mountain. You can track your buddies through your phone. And he just said, that's crazy. And I'm like, you know, like he's like, uh, yeah, I'm the founder of Android. <laughs> so, so, um, so that was there was two founders there of Android there. But he so so he put them on. and He's like blown away. So he called over all the people there. And he was at that time um, part of Google Ventures, and of course that started a whole thing where we were now running in parallel. You know, we're trying to raise the money. We were actually out of money, and I had to, that was going into that ski se snow season. That was the worst in the history of the company. So. Uh, I didn't know that at that time, but I was pretty bullish uh, because we sold 10,000 units of the Transcend in the f first seven weeks of launch. I went in, said, okay, we're going to launch two more products, one that's based on Android, one that's just the same as Transcend, but modular, same form factor, two price points. Uh, we're going to do both consumer and business to business. Like, I don't know what I was thinking. So I was doing the opposite of what I actually recommended you to do. Um, but uh, but, but so, so this was just all this money came in, and I was like, huh, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take over the world. Um, so through this uh, discussion with, uh, with Google, we had to come up with a pitch. And this was actually Larry Page in the background here that was pulling the strings here. And, uh, and we thought, man, we're going to have to argue for like, this crazy valuation. So what are we actually doing? So I went out, put this together, I think, with Fraser, one of the co-founders. And so this is what we're going to do in chapter one. We have all these lead users in the specialty market, you know, sports and recreation, productivity and safety, and so forth. Then by 2015, you know, you're going to have like all these, most of this was 2011, 2015, we're going to be smartphone complementer. And then, you know, 10 years later, 2021, 22, you're going to actually have uh, all these smartphones being sold a year, but, but we're going to start replacing smartphones. That's kind of the grand vision, right? That sounds great. But you know what? That was crazy, right? As we know today, it's very hard to predict the future, right? Yes. <clears throat> and you need to be very careful. <clears throat> um, Showing anybody your grand vision, except like your trusted inner circle and, and, and your employees. And you have to always 
uh, put caveats around that because it's when, when I see entrepreneurs come up to me with a slide like this and I do see that all the time I immediately am worried because I'm like you're not focusing on just doing what you have to do today and tomorrow to win in your market with your current product that is hard enough as it is most don't do that so don't think about being the Gandhi of technology and solving all this stuff that is unpredictable that will might or may or may not happen you may or may not be the one uh, doing it uh, so so this was, and I, and I don't know if Google, you know, they, they actually came up with Glass not much, much after this. Um, and there's a whole story behind that too. And we had Microsoft come up to us as well. So there was these sort of near exit events very, very early on, uh, which didn't happen. And, and I think for good reason. So lessons from this, the second last lesson here is having a grand vision is important, but don't get distracted by it. The future is uncertain and seismic events tend to be hard to predict. Focus on today and tomorrow and how you win in your market with your existing product. That's hard enough as it is. So this is all about focus. Doing X or Y, not X and Y. Last slide here. So this is uh, really about you as the entrepreneur. And, um, and I think this is a great, great co quote. I looked for a master my entire life until I realized I am the master that has to master myself. Um, and this is, this is really one of the most important things. I've told you a few anecdotes. There's probably 100 of them or more where you have to hustle. And, and, I, and hustle doesn't mean being dishonest. It's, it's really that there's a certain time when you have to declare, you know, what, you know, what the risks are or uh, de declare, declare the facts. And then there's sort of a gaming medium where both parties are gaming. Everybody's trying to get the best out of it. They have shareholders, you have shareholders. And if you're not good at hustling, you're going to be the one losing. You, know, you have to do it with integrity. And everybody knows that you're trying to do some engagement shit. Nothing happens until you create some kind of leverage or some kind of a, a situation where there's fear of missing out. So you have to kind of stretch the truth a little bit sometimes, but make sure that it's done in the right way. It's a, it's a fine art to do it. But you need to do that. You need to solve hard problems with the least amount of work, because otherwise, if you try and solve everything and you, you're, you're just too slow, and the world moves on. Know which fires to put out and which to let burn. There will be fires burning you know, when you go home. With the, the, there's all these things that are going wrong. And if you try and put them all out or you're too stressed about not having put them out, then you're going to actually die of stress. So it's great if you're a little bit of a procrastinator and good at working on a stress and you don't feel, I don't really feel stressed. I kind of get energized by it. But, but it, you don't have to be uh, you know, that crazy. It could just be that um, you know, you're actually cognitive about you know, asking yourself when there's something, a problem that needs to get solved, whether this is worth solving now or whether it's worth solving at all. And then more importantly, doubling down if it is worth solving now, then you go, you go all in. Um, last one, act with conviction. Again, if something, like once you find the stuff that you need to do, then you do it. You pour everything into it. You never give up because there's always a way out. You can always find a way out. And, and you'll be, you know, at the end of a cliff, they're looking into the abyss so many times. And... Um, and if you're an entrepreneur, you'll, you'll know this. It's terrifying the first couple of times, but then you find out that you are in charge. You, you, can, you can master. You can step back, retool, regroup, reconfigure. You are in charge. There's no, there, there's no boss you have to go back and ask for permission. You just do it. But you need to have humility to know what you don't know. That last part will kill you as an entrepreneur. Abs I think in life, actually. You need to know yourself, and you need to have zero ego. So that you can, and this is also part of being in a founder team, that you trust each other that, okay, this, you're better than that, me. And I always chase people that I know can do better than me. And I just, and I was like, oh, that's great. I found this. I just need it. And I don't care, like, that I'm part of it. I hardly do anything anymore. It's like I just work through other people, right? And it's like I don't even know if I can. I could barely put this presentation together. I'm like, oh, I used to have somebody I could just ask to do that. So it's, <laughs> so it's actually a great state when you get to a place where, where you know you can you can work through others. Um, so that's my final lesson. I think I went over time. I'm sorry about that. That's cool. I think time's up. And uh, thank you very much. Man. Thanks for having me.